Hey, 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 it's me, Mark, and welcome to part two of the Kickley interview from Talking Joe. Now, there are a couple of ways you can enjoy this experience. We have the whole interview on YouTube with Talking Heads and visuals being shared on screen. Uh, there's the full interview as a podcast. And what you are listening to now is part two of the interview split in half. In part one, we talked to Kickley about reinventing his career after having an accident, the influence of Monet on his book Musnay, and his follow-up book Purdy from Image Comics. In this second half, we are much more focused on G.I. Joe. So we talk about how G.I. Joe re-entered Kickley's life, the inspiration of the work of Hector Garrido and how that led to the sketches and prints and commissions that he's been doing and sharing. So lots of G.I. Joe in this second half and let's get into it. Now back to G.I. Joe. But getting back to G.I. Joe now, or I had an idea of using gouache, but I didn't want to do it because it just was too difficult. And I didn't really have a, an idea why. But when I, when I, my, my dad then passed away, like maybe two, uh, like two or three weeks before Christmas. And my kids were homesick. And I was running up and down from my studio to the bedroom because they were both sick. And they were like, I'm thirsty or I need this or I need that. And so I was like, oh, I'm not going to work at all. I'm like, my dad just passed away. They're sick. I'm just going to watch TV and just take care of them, you know, like that. So I started watching like a couple, YouTube recommended like a couple toy channels or something. And I was like, oh, I had that GI Joe when I was a kid. And it was like a restoration uh, video. So I watched them do one and then I watched another one and my kids were like, what are you watching out there? And I was like, ah, oh, just come out here and watch with me, you know? And I was, you know, did the old man thing of these are the toys that I had when I was a kid, you know, this is the best time to be a kid in my opinion. So we went to uh, Wisconsin then to see my wife's family for New Year's and they had like a retro toy shop there. And so I was like, let's go in there. Like we're, I got to see these toys now. Cause I, I kind of continued watching a lot of these toy channel stuff. And I picked up a few of these toys and it was like, wow, it's just like an instant. Like I felt the plastic and that pla I just remembered it, it was weird because my hands bigger than when it was, when I was a kid, that was the only difference. But I, I saw major blood. And I couldn't remember that he had that, that mech arm, you know, and it was like a solid piece. And I was like, I don't remember this at all. And I didn't have him. I didn't have that figure as a kid, but I just didn't remember that it was that way. And now getting into, uh, now I know that might drive some people crazy listening. It's not a mech arm, it's armor, you know, but I talked to Ron Rudat and he confirmed it was designed as a mech arm. So in your face no so <laughs> no because i get you get a lot of people he, he told me sorry ron but ron said please don't say that that i told you because <laughs> he gets it from everybody too of asking him is it in that car because i i think larry designed it or the way they did it in the comic then it was just armor because he was shooting uh missile you know the missile missile gun from it so it's protecting his arm but yeah i was just surprised and i saw a couple star wars figures that I couldn't remember at all, like uh, bounty hunter characters. And I was just like, huh? So my wife was like, don't think about buying any of this stuff. And I was like, don't worry, I'm not going to buy anything. And we went back and then I was on eBay looking these things up because I'm like, I don't remember this at all. And then I came across this one photo on eBay that was really well done. That was like white background and these toys were on it and it just made them look so good i'm like oh man i'm going back there tomorrow I'm buying these things because <laughs> i started thinking like well nobody i you know i've done all these paintings of you know v vases and flowers and all this stuff and i'm like it doesn't interest me at all other than learning how to paint but i'm like i wonder if i could paint these toys like they're plastic they give a 
sheen, you know, to to it. I'm like, I, I'm sure people would want to buy something like that. Like these are the people. This is my crowd, right? Like, like what I said before is like it was hard to try and figure out like how do I make that switch from comic books to then painting it's a complete you know the 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 transition of learning the business end was the easiest it's more or less like how do i get to this clientele of people wanting to buy paintings you know and do i i really want to sell paintings to people who are just going to put it in a closet and not even look at it you know i want to get to people who actually really love this stuff so that kind of hit an epiphany to me. And I went back, bought those toys and we came back home and I started sketching it. And I went around town here looking for other toy shops. And I found this one and the guy was like, Oh, you know, he goes, you should, you should join this one GI Joe group. It's really popular on Facebook. And, and uh, he's like, you should post your art there. So I, I, I listened to him and I went in there and posted and everybody started freaking out. And so that, that's kind of, then it was um, being addicted to buying GI Joe toys. Then let me, let me ask a specific question here because yeah, I can think of two different kinds of GI Joe art of yours. One, mm-hmm. maybe three. Um, there's sort of the scene, like the, the background of the title card that Mark came up for, for this came up with mm-hmm. for this episode. And then there are, there are paintings that look like action figures. And then there are paintings where you are redoing the Hector Greedo uh, package yeah. art. So do, do you see these three categories as uh, sort of really just one big thing? Are there big differences? Is it like you've moved from one to the other? Yeah, you know, at first it was just, I was getting these toys and I was looking at them and like how I was spending all this time in, in um, the museum studying all these master painters, I started looking at these toys of, wait a minute, somebody sculpted this, you know, somebody um, engineered these things. I wasn't looking at it from, you know, uh, an eight year old to, you know, 14 year old kid that was buying this stuff. I was looking at it from a designer perspective and uh, an artist's perspective. And so I just, at first, I was just kind of drawing the toys as I saw them, not thinking anything like, oh, this is my style. Um, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm the guy who draws. The, no, I was just literally having fun just studying them. And yeah, seeing like the first the the first series of GI Joe paintings that you you did you know if you sort of search out search them out they they look much more like the toy and you've drawn like rivets in the arms and these yeah yeah things. no and is, that, those, you know, those are, that's exactly where I started and then then from there I kind of got bored of it and I was just like all right I I don't want to do this you know because people were constantly being like, oh, this this other guy does that kind of thing. And I'm like, well, I'm not trying to do anything other than just have fun. This is me playing, playing with these toys, I guess, you know, just looking at them. And I'd look at them when I was a kid, too, and just look at all the detail and, and what made, made these figures, the figures and stuff. Um, so in, in a sense, that's kind of what I was doing. And then looking at all the color theory that they had apply to these characters of I thought it was so smart you know at least for the first <laughs> first eight years that the line <laughs> was you know then I started getting kind of wonky but um I as a kid I collected till I think 1988 I think was my last figures and then it, it just you know I, we went to um after Christmas break I remember at lunch the first day back, everyone was like, what'd you get for Christmas? And all the kids were like, well, I got a sweater and a skateboard and a bike. And I was like, what? I was like, didn't anyone get any Joes? And they're all laughing. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I'm the only one that got GI Joes. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, just kidding. You know, but in, in my head, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, oh no, these guys are all lame. They're all, they don't get any toys. So I just remember that. It's like you've had two ends of innocence. Yeah. 
that that so. day in 88 <laughs> and then the car accident it's like when you're no. when your childhood ended because you well, thought those you, th you thought yeah. those kids were lame but did they think you were yeah. lame for not getting yeah well, they didn't, I, you know, I, I don't remember. I just remember <laughs> Sam, like, I, I was like, this is really sad to hear, like, talking about sweaters and pants and, and shirts. And, <laughs> you know, I guess, I guess they were getting Nintendo games and stuff. Nintendo was kind of still, you know, not frowned, up, frowned upon. But um, the next style of toys, isn't it? It's new for yeah, in a, in a sense. Chunks yeah, of plastic but... to the pixels. But, um, Here's here's a question for you. So you talked about sort of finding that major blood um, in this in the shop and that waking all of these sort of thoughts and feelings and memories. Um, what um, what happened to your childhood collection? Um, they went away. The um, uh, my parents split up, and my dad was like, "We're not bringing this stuff with." And I think I was in ninth grade at the time. But even that, I was just like, I don't want to get rid of this stuff. These are my toys, you know. But we he had, we had a garage sale. And this was the saddest part of the story, I guess. Um, yeah, I watched all that stuff go away for like pennies, you know. Oh. So yeah, so. But it just was like, oh, well. You know, I kind of moved on, but I was able to, you know, some of the stuff we kept, you know, like some of the figures and stuff. But I, when I got back into it a few years ago, I, I called up, I went, went over to my dad's and stuff and, and they got rid of it all. I, I think my brother's kids probably found it and started playing with it and stuff. And, you know, it's all gone. <laughs> um, were you watching the TV show? Were you reading the comic book? Yeah, I was more of a cartoon kid. And then when I got back into it, you know, I I started seeing the comic and just being like, I can't believe I didn't, I've never read this, you know? And, you know, I knew about it, but, you know, kids were, kids were reading it at school, but I kind of felt guilty that here I'm a comic book artist and I didn't, I, I didn't ever read G.I. Joker <laughs> growing up or Transformers or any of that stuff. And so I started reading that. And I think I was at New York. Yeah, it was New York Comic Con. And I was walking by and it was early in the morning. You know, I got I get there early so I could walk the floor because, you know, I have like a artist badge and stuff and or a booth badge. And Larry Hama just sat down and I was like, oh, should I go over and say hi to him? And I was like, nah, just leave him alone. And I was walking and I was like, no, nah, I'm going to go say hi to him. <laughs> so I, I went over and I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, I, in my head, I was having all this big, huge dialogue because I'm like, what am I going to say to him? It's, it wasn't like, oh, I read your comics growing up. I, I Or do I say, I just started reading your comics, <laughs> you know, but I love G.I. Joe. But I, you know, I knew enough, like I'd watched some videos with him in it and about the history of everything and, and, you know, Ron Rudat designing it. And, you know, I was. I was meeting some of these guys or reaching out on Facebook or whatever, and they kind of knew who, who I was and what I was doing and they liked it, but I hadn't met Larry. So I went over and I was just like, what am I doing? Abort, abort, get out of this, you know, turn around. <laughs> but it was, he locked eyes with me. I was like, Oh, it's too late. And he just took a bite of like a muffin or a, a bagel or something with his coffee and I'm like, oh, now I'm interrupting his meal right before the show starts. I'm like, and so I was like, hi, you know, I introduced myself. And, and it was just, it was kind of awkward. I made it awkward. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't his fault. I was, just, But in my head, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. What do I say? And so I just, you know, I just wanted to say hi to him. And because I learned previously and why I wanted to say hi to him is because I just didn't realize like he's the biggest reason of the success of GI Joe, you know, he put in, he took these designs and breathed life into them, you know, and made them characters and gave them their backstories. And, you know, it's the reason why the cartoon was successful is because they took all of his work that they did and, you know, did what they did with it. And um, so I just, I just wanted to say hi to him. 
and uh and then i was in joe fest the one that me and tim met at ron rudat was sitting right next to me and larry was sitting on the other side because you know i they invited me to come down to the show and i wanted to go and i so i brought some of this artwork with and made some prints and stuff and sold them there but i made uh ron a really nice painting of his uh of leatherneck with the explosion because i can't remember did leatherneck have the explosion background or did that go to the digital background was it digital. the digital yeah. yeah so i was like ah he needed a proper explosion <laughs> background like he got gypped um and same with larry and so i made them like really nice paintings and gave them to them both and so it was really fun and when i went into the joe fest um to check into the into the hotel i was going up to the elevator and the rudats were right in front of me and i'm like oh do i say anything you know it was again this is after i met larry larry for the first time and i'm like i'm not gonna say anything <laughs> to ron and so we get in the elevator and we're and his wife kind of leans into me and whispers she goes we we're glad to see you my my husband's a big fan and i was like wait what and so then i said <laughs> hi to ron and he was like hi you know and and so then for the most part we went out to eat and we eat breakfast together everything it was just so weird you know because again it's like after, you know, I would look at these, literally look at these toys when I was a kid and my mom would always tease me. She would go, you know, you know, she'd tell my kids because I started getting these toys and they were playing with them then. And my mom was like telling them, you know, your dad would always say, you know what the best thing about these figures are is the detail, you know? And so, because I'd just look at them and just be like amazed with what they, what, how they were able to jam that much, um, information into those figures but still have it be vague you know there's like a nice balance of you know where you go from the star wars figures before that they they always frustrated me as a kid because you couldn't bend their knees and you know the the heads mm -hmm. in your tournament would, would pop off and and uh it just kind of seemed kind of lame because you'd look at the card art for star wars and you'd have the photo of luke skywalker and you look at the figure next to it and you'd be like that looks nothing like luke skywalker <laughs> it's so big where the gi joe i remember going down the aisle for the first time and it was just like seeing that explosion background was just like whoa what the heck is this and it just was like i was done with everything else and it was like this is what i want you know and going back to what you were asking of how i started using gouache that's when i recognized when i started looking at the uh, box art or the card art i started seeing like wait a minute this is gouache paint because this wouldn't be oil it's doing things that gouache would would do with with my small experience of using it i was like i need to start using this paint and that's when i started doing what i did it in paris i just started studying hector garrido's art his his uh paintings and trying to recreate it and that then in turn uh, it's kind of like a two-folded uh thing of uh i'm gonna study hector garrido and i'm gonna learn how to use gouache paint so that then was i started doing that and putting after garrido and everybody was like what does that mean after garrido and so then i started championing him being like this is the guy who nobody knows about that influenced your whole childhood when you walk down that lane because most of the people that i talked to had the same exact experience they were going into the store for something else and then they went down this aisle and it was like what is this explosion stuff i want that and it just was a complete game changer it was brilliant um i'd imagine uh kirk kirk Bazigian had a big, huge, you know, like all everything. It was like all the things, you know, from Larry doing all the information on the back, Ron designing these really cool figures and and Cobra logo and all this stuff, and then 
you have this painter that was able to do this kind of stuff. It just, they, it hit him all. And, you know, I guess the sculptor, I, I, I forget the sculptor's name, like that worked on a lot of this stuff. Here's a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Are you certain the original paintings are gouache? Are they, are they not acrylic? No, it's, it's gouache. Cause I, when I was at that Joe Fest, they had a big, they had an original there that was um, torpedo. And I went up to it. And as soon as I went up to it, cause I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, I wonder if you use different kind of paint. Nope. It's gouache. It's gouache. Cause I've used enough of it now where a, th this was a medium that was used during, you know, advertising era. It dries so quick and it's matte. Um, and it's very easy to correct. You know, if you need to make a change, um, and correct something, it dries super quick. Where oil, again, it takes weeks to dry. Acrylic, I don't know. Acrylic has a plasticky look when it dries and it's also reflective. Now they've made new paints that are acrylic gouache, but I don't think they had acrylic gouache back then. Acrylic gouache is uh, the same thing, but it just, it the acrylic gouache, when it dries, it's now it, you can't re reactivate the the pigment with water. It's it's dry when it dries. Where the um, the gouache that I use, it's if you get it wet again, it'll reactivate. So Hector Garrido's uh, granddaughter reached out to me after seeing this painting that you have up, and she was like, "Thank you for doing this," and she. She let me know that he got a copy of this and he was really happy that before he died, he goes, he, you know, I don't want to start crying, but um, he, he said he was really touched and he didn't know if anyone would ever remember him from the work that he used to do. And this made him feel happy that someone did. So it made me feel good. So I sent her the original art that I did. And then I did another piece when he passed of all the G.I. Joe walking down there. It is honoring him. And you can see the Argentine flag uh, behind Gung. I think that might be uh -huh. Gung Hall there. So, but yeah, she was, she was really happy with this. And, you know, I, I was like, I'm never going to sell this piece or the other piece. So I sent it to her to stay in the family. Wow. We often ask people what G.I. Joe is to, to them, whether it's the toys, the cartoons, the, the comics, first and foremost. And hearing this, the, the stories that, that you've talked that, um, from, from another interview you did, talking about sort of the experience of going into the shops, it almost feels like it was the, the card art, first and foremost, yeah. that, that made you the G.I. Joe fan, that you might go go into the shop thinking you'd buy one figure mm -hmm. and then coming away with something entirely different just based on um, the, the reaction to, to the art on the front of the card. Yeah. The cartoon, you know, got me hyped. You know, I was like, oh, my gosh, I want I want this character. You know, I, I want Snake Eyes. or You know, I, I, my first figure was Snake Eyes, uh, 82. And I remember my old i have uh four brothers so i'm i'm second to the youngest um so there's five of us and my middle brother came home with i think it was um must have been uh flash the jump pack you know like the the uh the platform with the uh, with the back which i can't remember if if uh grand slam I think Grand Slam came with that, right? That's right. Um, yeah, with the so we had the silver, the silver or the red. Version. Yeah, it was the silver or the red, but I, I'm pretty sure it was the silver version. And then uh, Snake Eyes '82 and a Cobra Officer. Well, my brother was like, "Which one do you want?" I picked Flash, so I was like, "Well, I'm picking Snake Eyes. I would have picked Snake Eyes anyways. Black, you know, it's it, it's always my favorite color if that's a color." <laughs> and then my youngest brother got stuck with the Cobra Cobra officer. <laughs> so, but 
you know, that was already, cause I remember getting back into the toys and seeing the Ninja version of snake eyes, but I was like, how come I never got this? It's just because I already had in my kid brain, it was like, I already have snake eyes. Why do I need another snake eyes? Um, and his, his hand broke. So then I gave him, um, uh, Chewbacca's gun, which had that little clip, you know, on, so it would yeah. hold into it. So it was like, that was his gun then. But yeah, it's the card art. I would, I would say, yeah, the, you know, the cartoon, I loved watching the cartoon, but the cartoon was just the cartoon, right? You just come home and cartoons was on. So it was fun to watch it. But yeah, the, the card art, I, I remember, I, I didn't really remember as a kid, but psychologically, when they did go from the explosion to that digital explosion, it kind of did, it took me out of it psychologically. I wasn't as interested. <laughs> and so that that must have been, what, 86? Wow. 86 that they did that. So 87, 88. But, you know, I was still into it because of the cartoon. And then the movie came out. And I remember watching that being like, what the heck am I watching? It was, <laughs> you know, monsters. And, you know, I draw, like, a lot of monsters and creatures now. And I think it was because of that. Because it, it was, like... Hmm weirdly i wanted to stop watching it but i couldn't look away <laughs> kind of deal <laughs> and i just thought it was like oh, especially at the end when all the the whole cobra law is transforming and all the bugs are coming out and and slugs and everything you know all the creatures and stuff and uh i was just like i didn't i didn't know what to make of it but i i did kind of like it you know but then, then it totally changed, right? With the uh, the Deke um, version, that's when I was completely out because uh, they changed the whole intro and the song, and the voices weren't really the same. And I was just like, "Yeah, I'm done." <laughs> so got to get tough. Yeah, I got to get tough. Yeah, I it, now I hear that song and I'm like, yeah, "It's not bad. It's it's kind of fun," you know. I've I've interviewed the guy who sang that. Oh yeah, cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Did he sing it for you live? Did he do Sorry? like a live did he do a live singing of it? No, but he is alive. He's in he's oh, in California. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I often think what it like when I hear the original G.I. Joe, because you hear the commercial versions of when they did the comic, you know, promoting the comic on uh the commercials, and then you hear some of the iterations of then the toy commercial ones, and then you get the the cartoon or the first miniseries version and you know the guys guys who are singing i don't know if it's one guy or a couple guys or like an um how they did that but uh you can tell like there's a change but i always think about wonder because he just you know the way his voice is he kind of sounds um i don't know it's kind of seems it's a it, it's cool how it came together but i i often think about him whenever i hear the him singing what i wonder what it was like when he was singing this in the uh recording studio <laughs> it's too bad they don't have a uh, um, video or doc i like to put together a documentary on something like that but um kickily um i i hesitate to try and put these two things together lest the the magic spell be broken but uh -huh. you make comics Yep. You paint G.I. Joe art. Uh huh. And there's a company out there which <laughs> puts G.I. Joe art on packages. And there's another company out there which makes G.I. Joe comics. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah. I could with, could that happen? Are you interested? It could. You could. I don't know. It's for something like with how everything's ever happened with me. I've always kind of just gone with the flow. I haven't forced anything. The few things that I've forced, I've always regretted being like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have, you know, now I have, I'm in this and I have to finish it. So I've kind of learned like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, you know, but I'm not going to sit there and champion and, and go to these companies and ask to be in it. They all know who I am. They all know what I'm doing. It's a very small world. I, I see on my Instagram and story modes that people are checking out my stuff, you know? So it's, if they want me to, I, I'd love to, I, I, I always said like, I'd love to work with Larry, 
you know, to me, GI Joe is he's GI Joe. He knows all these characters. He's based them all on people he knows. I don't know how you can write these characters yourself without making something completely new. And it seems like this is what Skybound's doing with their with their side projects that Larry isn't doing is they're 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 just making it's almost kind of almost like a cartoon like what the cartoons did from the comic book they're kind of doing that with their lines of things so so yeah i'd love to you know people are always saying you should do box art and stuff and it's like i know hasbro knows who i am so if they just have to ask like <laughs> i'd love to do it you know it'd be fun it's you know i i do this stuff for the fun of it you know um i'm goofing around it went from like so this is the last painting or the last drawing that i did of the last series i've been kind of working my way through the years of gi joe and this is this was 1986 the 1986 line it's just me goofing around and having fun again i i love this stuff it's my favorite toy line you know i i had he-man or some He-Man. I, again, I had Star Wars before, but as soon as G.I. Joe was there, it was game over, you know. And um, it's fun to come back to it and goof around and try things out. This is where I kind of experiment on things, especially like computer coloring or, or painting. You know, this whole series was was kind of a combination of painting and computer coloring. So I was kind of just, uh, you know, where it's a little bit harder like I was saying with Musne or, or the things that I create for myself, it's, you just, you don't have much time to work on things. You know, you got to get them done quickly. So there's, there's not a lot of experimenting going on. So this, at least I, I can work on one of these pieces a day and kind of just try something and see how it works. And then the next one begets the next and going from, first drawing kind of just studying the toys and making it look like the toys getting bored with that and then going okay i'm going to start drawing this stuff on its on its own and now i'm to the point where i'm just kind of making story the last two series i started just making story of uh you know kind of in the background you know of uh these characters and stuff like that so i don't I don't know where it might go to, but yeah, that, that would make the most um, logical sense is doing something official for Hasbro or, or for, um, for Skybone. In looking at this, um, all these images that Mark has put up, uh, my brain is trying to find a place where they fit historically yeah. mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, you know, the ones that are after Garrido package paintings look like Garrido package paintings like that, like I, that makes sense. The ones yeah. that are definitely drawings of toys. I can mm -hmm. imagine an artist sitting at a desk or a table with toys in front of them. Um, some of them like this one and that one from the end of the movie looking downward mm -hmm. feel like to me, uh, like story books, like yeah. those paint like Earl Norum did a bunch yeah, of them in yeah, the 80s yeah, where there's golden, text yeah, yeah text on the left side and like a painting mm -hmm. on the right side and yeah. and I'm I'm fascinated that in a in one like this uh Serpentor is so tight this becomes uh like finger quotes sort of normal comic book illustration it's this like mm -hmm. american adventure style comic book illustration there's thick lines there's thin lines there's some spotted mm -hmm. blacks there's like a little bit of contrapasto but then like that arctic scene with uh is it is it scarlet or lady j and there's a kid in the in the road in the middle of the oh, road yeah yeah snow cat with all the um yeah. polar assault troopers mm -hmm. um like that one like there are a couple lines in sort of the backpacks of the uh the cobra arctic troopers that it's like it just becomes so gestural or like yeah. the, the outline of one becomes sort of the outline of another and it, yeah. it like starts to i don't say this i don't say this in a in a in an insulting way like sort of fall apart or like break up mm -hmm. it's like no i can see where this is more 
uh, gesture abstract impression yeah, yeah it's like yeah. i'm seeing i'm seeing the artist's hands i'm seeing the marks like there's that line all the way on the right side which on screen right now lines up sort of with your head and shoulders mm -hmm. it's like kind of the backpack outline and i just see like yeah. a giant brush dab of ink <laughs> um yeah and these these so many of these images sort of like shimmer they like shift from being a real story moment in my imagination mm -hmm. or in a real place to being like maybe a moment from an animated commercial for the toys or like yeah. it's like no no i see an artist like definitely painting an action figure and a vehicle mm -hmm. whether or not they're rivets it's like something about the amount of detail or the yeah the proportions uh so it's a very long way of saying i like <laughs> yeah well no and that's kind of you know from where i started with you know studying the figures like i said they're vague but they have like a lot of detail in them too and it it might be from how you know because when they originally the the sculptor originally sculpted it they were probably like six seven inches and then they got rotoplaned or whatever that system is to make them a smaller figure and so there's this loss of detail because of you know taking this giant thing that isn't you know uh from blender you know, it's an actual sculpture that they then use this technology to make it then a smaller figure that they could make a, a mold or a cast out of. It's like each one of those generations that probably lost detail upon it. And then, you know, me studying all these impressionist painters and, you know, um, abstract painters and stuff like Picasso or, or um, Manet or, you know, it's like, uh, Matisse, I should say. It, it's just all this stuff kind of melded into what it is and, and brought me back, you know, when I came back into toys, it just that that was kind of more of the thing that, like I said, I, I see this stuff as art. And these guys who were making it were very in, intelligent. It, it You know, they're making things for kids. Um, but they're intelligently making problem solving these these uh coming up with solutions to make it simple so it works right and so it's cost effective for the company to make to mass produce these product and you know you have all these engineers and and whatnot making toys so um I was going to say on the on the other other end of the scale, you've sort of also done like a a handful of paintings, which are sort of more in this style that I've just put on the screen, mm -hmm. which sort of feels yeah. to me like it's closer to that promotional, uh, you know, painted art that mm -hmm. was was being done. And Tim will probably be able to better describe where that was all used. Yeah. But it's a much more it feels much more uh, like a painting, painting, yeah. you know, action uh, action scene, which which. I'm guessing you were trying to to emulate some of the, the yeah. look of those paintings. That was a massive. That was the biggest thing I ever did. That was like, oh, wow. um, it was like four feet tall by six feet Ooh. wide. It's just Ooh, gigantic. What? Yeah, yeah. This one artist commissioned this uh, Dave Cho. He commissioned oh, wow. me to paint that. Yeah. So I like that. That took me. I was like, okay, I'm gonna actually take my time. And it took me two months to do, you know. Um, how do you, I was like, this is the gonna... this is the Facebook billionaire David Cho, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he uh... reached out. I, I had a mutual friend, and I was like, is you know, because they he just reached out through Instagram. Was like, hey, I stumbled upon your work. He he wow. read Purdy, my comic book Purdy, and he was like, hey, I just want to let you know, like, this is the best comic I've read in a long time. And he goes, I love your pop culture stuff. Could you do a painting for me? And so I, I, <laughs> I had a friend that knew him and I, I was like, okay, somebody's pulling my leg here. <laughs> and so I just reached out to my friend. He was like, no, that's him. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I got to jump in here. Uh, four feet by six feet. Yeah. It's, this is, this is probably from old Instagram because it makes it a square. There's right, more, no, um... there's more, there's more, um, there's missing um, pieces on the on the uh, the other side, but yeah, it's big. No, I, I just need to I just need to say this for our listeners and viewers. You know, a comic book is like seven by ten, <laughs> in, like ten inches, <laughs> yeah. and a regular standard like Marvel Comics poster at your comic book store is two feet by three feet, 
and this is twice as wide and twice as long as a standard uh just shipping this would be a beast yeah it, it was it was a pain like i went to uh <laughs> home depot and bought some um of this pressed uh like it's like it's not it's not wood it's not car cardboard it's something in between it's like this pressed uh, fiber board or something and i had them cut it and i just shipped it sandwiched in that and then i sandwiched it in cardboard on the outside and shipped it so it wouldn't bend and yeah it was a pain but <laughs> yeah that took that took about two months to do but it was fun it was fun that's all i worked on too i was like every day i was sitting there looking at what how do i do this how do i do that it's the the explosion the, the 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 parts that's missing i'm looking at it so it's on my right where you can see where um quick hit quick kick is on the bottom and then it goes to stalker and then it goes to uh jinx and then i think beachhead might be in there and then it's a uh, spirit i don't know who's getting crapped out there but there's more on that side because there's a bunch of bats like they're coming up on this on the left side there there's just as many bats on the other side and then there's a few trouble bubbles in the air and the explosion is on the other side presumably so, you you took a good photo not for instagram yeah no i scanned it all in yeah i scanned it all in 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 10 in parts little, yeah and it's like it's got to wow. be at least 14 wow. 14 scans yeah oh man cuz i've got a, a a 13 by or a big big huge canson scanner so it took that many times yeah it was a pain to scan in but yeah i was like i i don't want to ship this and not have a good scan of this just in case something happens to it so but this is where i learned because i did this on gouache too this is where i learned i probably should have used oil because there's certain limitations to gouache like once you kind of start getting a little too big it it's very hard to um have the have the pigment f flow the way you want to because i'm i'm wanting to make a brush stroke and it's dry by the time the brush stroke ends you know the paint is dry so it 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 would have been nice to have it still be wet that you could kind of go wet into wet or even if you're working on it for a few months like you have some tacky stuff or you have some dry stuff and you can kind of go wet over dry and all that so I don't know. It was it was a fun ex, you know, fun fun painting to do. Yeah, I put that was that was fun cuz again I was still learning of I I'd like to do another big one. I've got ideas of of uh giant GI Joe paintings, you know, where <laughs> I do like a whole season of uh, cuz again it's like me focusing on these seasons of like I said I'm in just finished 1986. It's fun to kind of go through and be like look at it from a from a standpoint of this is this is the cast that was put out you know look at the cartoon during that time look at the comic books during that time promoting that look at all the commercials that were coming out and just kind of see i see holes you know of like well, i would have did it like this and that's kind of what i've learned by doing this is like well i'm just going to do that i'm going to kind of sneak in there and just kind of plop my little ideas that don't um it and i hope that i i enhance the experience instead of you know just being like i'm just going to do it my way what i see here is a mixture of 82 up through 86 characters mm -hmm. which is not really something that we would have seen yeah. on the cartoon because there were memos sent to los angeles yeah that said don't include these older characters <laughs> yeah yeah because they're, they're they're not available for sale anymore we're not promoting that so yeah just to see scarlet and stalker with uh -huh. some 86 bats my my brain is slightly folding yeah to to make room for it well also this is this was dave's like he gave me a list i said who's your favorite characters and he gave me this list so i was like that's what i'm going to use you know so I, I i played around with his favorite uh and and quick kick was his was his ultimate favorite character so i had him front and center kind of deal you know even though he was kind of he's backing up but i i you know 
in the cartoon, I remember he was kind of, I don't know, he's kind of like comedy relief, you know, kind of handled that way. So, but yeah. I was going to say, you were talk, talking about sort of making making story and sort of crafting story in this latest set of mm-hmm. um, 20 or so that, that you, you did. And definitely this 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 image is what came to mind about uh you definitely playing with with story that we've got this sna- yeah. <laughs> four-breasted yeah. snake creature well, on the, this the operating first one, table the first one never never works properly you know watching that uh the first mini series or the the mini series that they were making sepenter the first version of him was like a monster or whatever so i was like well they're making a sepentress you know uh, queen for her him uh it's not going to turn out you know and you know it's it's more the background story that's going on because you have uh snake eyes picking up jinx and then uh cover girl um the blonde version of cover girl which i liked always liked better cuz she looked different right it it was just like i'm i'm telling yeah i'm just kind of goofing around and telling the story i always thought dr mindbender was is always kind of weird with with his get up of uh no shirt <laughs> no shirt and the the suspender things and a cape you know but i was like ah, i didn't want to give him a cape because he's working you know so uh yeah I, I don't know it's just me goofing around and, and just having fun fun with the idea of like yeah what would you walk into snake eyes what you know the the story started becoming with this last series is they infiltrated the pterodrome on Cobra Island. And as it went on, they first uh, uh, rescued Sergeant Slaughter in, in a piece previous to this. And that made me start thinking like, well, why was Sergeant Slaughter in, in, the, in the jail? And then I, I kind of was going further because I'm like, at some point, I know I'm going to get to Dr. Mindbender, right? And we're going to be in his lab. So... <laughs> And initially I had um, General Hawk up there instead of Cover Girl. But when I drew the Sepentris, I, I just started drawing. I was like, oh, that would be funny if they're making, because I was like, what are they making? And and it's kind of listening to Larry talk. It's kind of how I work too. And I, I fi- kind of feel akin to him as well. It's just like one thing begets the next. It's It's the fun of it is, is seeing how what happens with it it's not this is my idea i'm writing it i can't deviate from this thing it has to be this i can't change it at all because once you start getting into that it the piece becomes very boring and it's very boring and laborious to work on something this long and not have it be fun so the last two things that i changed was was a the sepentris once i that formed because it was just a blob there that i had i just kind of do this blobby human shape and then as soon as i gave it the four breast kind of thing i was like oh it's a it's a sepentris you know and then i was like oh general hawk needs to change in the background it needs to be and and i was like oh i want to draw the blonde cover girl but i always laugh now because i i drew uh sergeant slaughter being so it was is sergeant slaughter's dna and sepentris as well <laughs> i don't know probably sorry Sarge, okay two but, you know two process questions one okay. what kind of paper is this or what kind of paper do you work on it's this stuff when i started drawing sports or when i actually started drawing um like during the pandemic the pandemic hit and they canceled the Minnesota State Fair, which Minnesota State Fair is like this big, huge, it's the, probably the biggest state fair in the whole country. We have a like a a location that it, it's a ghost town throughout the whole year, except for when the state fair happens. It's kind of like spirited away. If you've ever seen that Miyazaki movie where she goes into this town and then at night it starts to come alive. That's the way this location is for the for for the Minnesota State Fair. They use it for other things, but it's really creepy when you go in there because it's just abandoned, like this abandoned town. You know, they canceled that, and I was like, "Oh no, I've gone to the State Fair now every year for for forty some years since I was uh, you know since I was born." And I was kind of like, "Well, I'm going to start doing paintings of this place." And then it got to the point where I was like, you know what, I could probably make a really cool book where it makes it feel like you're walking through the state fair. 
anytime you want, like a coffee table book. So I did that and I've gone now and painted there live, you know, did the same thing where I, I'd go and paint. And that led me kind of into sports because I started painting because I'd stopped going to Paris like uh, right er, the last time was 2019 and then the pandemic hit and I hadn't been back since. So I started painting sports and I, I just started using this paper that my, my printer had that I, I was like, this seems like a nice paper. It's not meant to be painted on or anything uh, per se, but I just liked how the paint absorbed into it. And so I just started using that. Now I kind of use it for everything. I use it for, uh, what is it? Just this, uh, here's my latest one that I'm drawing here before you guys came mm. up. Okay. But it's just this paper. I don't know what it's, it's I, I have to look, but. It's not, it's, it's not a, Bristol. No, but it kind of has a Bristol quality. Like when I, when I'd ink on it and use like a nib and stuff, it doesn't, it doesn't tear. It doesn't uh, gum up the nib at all. It has like a really hard surface and it's some bristol that i've used you know it absorbs moisture at a certain point and it would always annoy me and even trying to paint on bristol is it every once you know sometimes you'd get some paper that it was good but sometimes you'd get paper and it wouldn't react the same so i knew this paper if i started using it like it's consistent because printers are printing on it so I just started again experimenting on it. It's not um perfect, but I just got used to it. And um okay, second process question, and I yeah. think I know the answer to this. Photos of your paintings often have your hand holding a brush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, cuz too many people started taking my work and they would send me like they'd go, "Hey, look at this t-shirt I made." And I'm like, I, I didn't make t-shirts of that. They're like, yeah, I, I made myself one. I just took it off the internet and made it. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't, I didn't make any money. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, it's kind of, it's kind of stealing though. And they're like, I'm a big fan of your work. Or people would then send me photos of their stu or of their toy thing or whatever. And they'd have all my work all over the walls and they'd just print out the, uh, the image, you know, cause I'd put up JPEGs and stuff and they'd just print it out and they'd, they were like, I'm a big fan. Look at, you're all over my, you're all over my toy room or whatever. And I'm like, you didn't buy any of that. So then I just started taking photos of me with my hand in it. Cause I figured, well, if they're gonna print this out, it's gonna have my hand in it. <laughs> so I don't know. Could your could your watermark instead be a photo of you like this? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Like on the it's, bottom it's right. A, it's a part of the game, right? It's like you you know, I try not to get too upset about it. I don't know. I, I just I just decided that I wouldn't uh put such nice scans up, you know. Right. Uh, before we started the formal interview, we were asking you a little bit about your studio mm -hmm. and you were, uh, pointing out a bunch of manga by two or three key manga people on two shelves behind you and a bunch of art books. Yep. And then you turned your camera and we saw <laughs> a vamp, a hiss and a terror drone. <laughs> yeah, so you. can you give us a little tour of your studio? Uh, you, you can stay seated if you want, but could you... Could you perhaps turn your 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 screen yeah. a little bit and just point out some things? Oh, here you go. This way. Well, I got part of my books here, and then around that corner, that brown there. There's another bookshelf that goes that way. That's more of my European stuff. And then let's see here. I've got a whole stack there on the ground of in my uh, long boxes. And yeah, my toys, my toys are, let's see here, you can see my desk here, some of the toys <laughs> that I have, and then you can see all the cabinets that I have of all my toys and stuff. But, and your your kids are not allowed in here? No, they're, they're allowed. 
but you know they're older now i had you know i had a flag set up in here and you know they were playing with that i'd always kind of say you know be don't mash this stuff together you know it's not it's uh to remind them that's a 30 year old plastic you know <laughs> it's not gonna uh fare well but they have good memories with it too that was kind of the fun part is when i started collecting again they were still young enough that they were right at that perfect age of of uh to be able to play with it you know my daughter and my son and so they had you know my daughter quickly uh went to all the girl the girl joes you know and baroness and stuff and she had you know she was she was having fun playing with those too so i you know it 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 made me feel good to be like oh okay we have some kind of connection between my childhood and and their childhood because hearing them play in the background when i was drawing it's just like it's the same sounds it's the same noises it's the same scenarios because i you know i i gave them the comics to read and stuff and the neighbor kids they they were into transformers before and so once my son started showing them gi joe and stuff they were like what the heck is this and so i made them a deal i gave them those idw uh um hard hardbound collections and i said okay if you read the first two volumes you can come back and i you know i had it like from wild finds and and from people sending me a bunch of toys and stuff like that for in trade for drawings and whatnot i had amassed a pretty big toy collection quick but i you know from some of the wild finds i'd have you know, semi, they weren't beat, they're beaters, but they were not, nice enough for like a kid to use. So I told them, I said, well, if you read some of these comics and you come back and you answer some of these questions that I have for you that I know that you read the comics, <laughs> you guys can pick a few figures, you know? And so they came back and they were like, oh, and they, they read them and they liked the, you know, they, I wanted to get them to read the comics first. Cause again, I felt guilty of not ever reading the comics before. So they picked like uh, the one neighbor kid, he really loves Storm Shadow. So he picked the Storm Shadow, you know? And I was like, yeah, you can pick whatever ones. And so it was fun. Then they would play GI Joe and use Transformers and all this stuff. So yeah, I felt good of like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the next generation <laughs> into this stuff. <laughs> so. Okay, so we have talked about two out of four big quadrants of your work. We haven't really talked about sports art uh, mm -hmm. and we haven't really talked about about purdy mm -hmm. but as a more general question um what are some things you are working on now besides that you can talk about besides more fun gi joe paintings yeah gi joe like i was thinking before the interview i'm like well a lot of the stuff i guess what people are seeing of my stuff on social media is the stuff that i you know I don't mind sharing to the world, you know, where everything else that I'm working on, I don't, I don't show anybody this stuff. Like I've do tons of work all day. And, and so it's fun to be able to at least be able to post something and, and have fun and have a response. And, and, uh, but right now I'm working on a comic called Tiempos Finales, which was my also previous, the first thing I've ever worked on through the pandemic and stuff, I started thinking, I've always been thinking about these characters, you know, it was an option through focus features and universal studios to be turned into a movie, live action movie and all this stuff. And going through all that, it was kind of strange to see how the whole system works and to say the least. And I've always thought like, how would I do this if I, if I ever did this again as a comic and with the whole pandemic and stuff um started making me think about it and it got me back into drawing the character and then i was like i'm gonna start working on this book so i i did um the first four, 30 40 pages of it and then i got covid and it would it reactivated. It didn't give me any of the symptoms other than the pains that i had from the car accident so like for like two weeks, I was like aching in all the spots that I forgot that I was hurt from. And I was just laying down and just being like, oh, this is this this is not fun. It wasn't as much pain, but it still hurt. 
And I was like, I'm sick of being in my studio all the time. All I do is I come here, I work 12, 14 hours a day and I, you know, I see my family and, and but it's just, I want to do something else. And my brother had season tickets for um, the local NHL team, the Minnesota wild. And he said, Hey, they have a, they have a 10 game home stretch. Do you want to come to some of these games? Cause they're during the week and I can't really find people to be able to come during the week. And since, you know, I work from home or from my studio home, you know, it's pretty much like most people in my family think I don't work at all. I'm just up here goofing around. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll come to some of these games. And so I always bring my sketchbook with, and so I just started sketching the game and everybody behind me then was just like, what are you doing? How, how, why are you doing this? And then the next game I was like, I wonder if I could bring my paints. Like, can I paint sports at the same time as, you know, as it's going on? So I just started doing that and, and I could, you know, <laughs> that's what I learned. And, and everybody, again, everybody behind me was taking photos and videos of me doing this. And I wasn't really paying attention to that because I was trying to get the painting done. But it started kind of really blowing up uh, here locally. And then then news channels reached out and they're like, are you really doing this live during the game? Can we follow you around with cameras and stuff? And I'm like, yeah. And they'd come and follow me around for two or three paintings and they're like, okay, we got enough. And I'm like, well, I'm just getting warmed up. You know, you didn't even get a good painting. You got some of my, you know, they're like, nope, we got enough. We got to go. So they didn't even stick around for the whole game. And yeah, it's just, then the team started asking me and the Vikings made me their official artist for um, uh, not last this last season, but the season before. And, um, you know, I painted for the PGA golf, NHL, MLB, you know, I, there I am in the, in the, the broadcast booth, you know? Okay. So I, I think, I think some of our listeners and viewers understand freelance illustrators who do work for clients, like there's an article in a magazine and there needs to be like a caricature of like a movie director or like maybe, you know, like there was a set of like uh, baseball cards 20 years ago. Like yeah. the chase set was like artwork. It was like computer yeah. enhanced artwork, but not mm -hmm. just photos. Yeah, This feels either from a different planet or yeah. like just very 1940s and 1950s. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure like where to put this because I, I don't have a lot of examples of big institutions hiring artists. No. to do this kind of work. So yeah. where is your work getting reproduced? And like, what are the, not like, what's the deal? Like, what's your contract? But yeah, uh, what are your discussions when, can we do that first one? Where is this artwork going? For the most part, it goes in my studio in a big stack in my closet, you know? Because <laughs> so, again, it's like, everybody wants to buy these things, but I'm also like, well, do I really want to sell my rookie season paintings <laughs> right now? Like, do I really want to do that? Like just understanding sports and, and baseball cards or any of that <laughs> stuff. It's like, that's the stuff that's going to be worth a lot in like 10 years when all the, but uh, then I say that and I've given a lot away to the players, of rookies who got their first hit or home run or, you know, or a big moment like uh, for a player, it, it went to the player and they said, it's awesome. I sent it to my mom, you know, and meaning she's going to take care of it. And then because then we had the Minnesota Twins who they won two World Series and all these old guys that won the World Series are kind of still around here. Kent Herbeck and, um, you know, um, uh, Tim Laudner and, and Dan Gladden and stuff. And I kind of get to meet some of these old guys, but these guys are like royalty because they're the only team around here. That's won. everybody else has not won, won a um, championship. So they're telling me like, you know what? A lot of these players, they won't really appreciate what you're doing until they're retired. Cause 
they can't really they they it's probably really strange and i've been think i've i've been thinking about it cuz i don't appro- like anything like i told you i'm not approaching hasbro or any comic book company and saying hey can you please let me work for you i you know look at look at my work or my portfolio i don't care about any of that the thing that i care about is doing a, a good job and having fun doing it that's it i don't care about fame i don't care about making the money i don't care about any of that after the accident it's like i said all my perspectives changed and everything that i was doing in the old life my old artist life it wasn't like i was doing that but trying to figure it out and having all these examples in front of me of like do you do it like this do i do it like that and it's kind of like not and i was maybe trying to do that but even even in my old life like all the publishers wanted me to work for the marvel dc all these french companies you know yeah europe asian places and i would say no and when i was laying in bed after the car accident i had 3 4 months laying in bed thinking about all the decisions that i made and i was thinking did i should i have done that was i wrong and that's all i thought about for 4 months cuz i couldn't do anything and you know it, it wasn't a good place to be in but so then i was like okay i'll work with publishers then after the car accident you know when they approached me i was like okay i'll i'll work but the first thing that i saw was like no i was right i want to do this by myself it doesn't really matter about being in every bookstore or everyone knowing who i am or being whatever fame or money or any of that stuff it's like at the end of the day did i make something really cool did i have fun doing it did it mean something to me and that's it i don't care if people like this or not i'm having fun and this is what the sports stuff is Th- these people cannot figure me out <laughs> worth anything they don't understand me because I am not uh, I'm not trying to do things for self gain and for money. And it does not it, they just they don't know what to do with with it. They come at me and I say this is what I want. I just want access. There's a there's a kind of a through line from the the sort of sports stuff that you're doing to and looking yeah. at the kind of the GI Joe stuff that yeah. you're doing yeah. to to me because there's this thing of fun there that that if if you you know someone says can you draw me snake eyes and they just draw a cool pose of snake eyes like this and you know can you draw me baroness and it's just you know baronet but when when you're being asked for these commissions you're going over and above all yeah, these you, you know I'm you're not just fun. drawing exactly yeah it, I'm and it I'm shows around and it's like i'm trying to pay respect to larry to kirk to to ron rudat to Hector Garrido to all these guys that worked on it that got no credit you know it's like these guys dump their lives into this stuff you know they spend all their life doing this stuff i don't want to come in and crap on it like i told you the thing that i learned the most was from monet's garden where i was just like wait a minute i have to be very careful here Like this isn't just but this isn't about me coming in here and being like oh you know I'm going to try and get known or whatever. It's like no I'm this is about this person and I need to make sure that it's about them and not about me, you know? And it's 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 lifting them up. I was interviewed by a person in the uh Monet's Garden for their little newspaper and she asked me she was like and this was after like this big huge tour that I went on I was super exhausted. and we were sitting down on this bench in front of Monet's house in the garden before they opened it up for the general public and she was interviewing me and she goes do you think Monet would be proud of what you did and i don't know if it was because i was super tired i just started crying you know cuz i didn't i was like it just caught me off guard because i thought about him and what i was doing you know so again it's that kind of same thing of how i'm approaching this I don't know. I'm assuming all these guys, you know, I've kind of pulled myself back from getting to know people or anything cuz it just I don't know at, at the end of the day what am I going to do? But I just 
I hope that they see what I'm doing as being respectful to them. And again, it's trial and error of things. It's like I get a goofy idea, I do it, you know, I just see, you know, it's like, I don't know. But for the most part, it's it's the same thing with the sports stuff is like, you know, these people, these athletes, I don't want to be their friends. You know, I'm not trying to make them buy anything or anything or get any certain kind of favor from them. I'm just trying to do a good job. That's all. There was um, I saw an interview with you where where you said that a lot of people call you fast because clearly you 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 produce this stuff at an astonishing rate that I think would <laughs> boggle the mind of most most artists and 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 it's in, it's incredible. But I think you had a I don't know if you can remember what you you said to to that, but but you said that you'd prefer to to be thought of instead of being fast accurate. as, as... accurate. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I like to be accurate. And it's again, it's like I put in my my homework. You know, a lot of the sports stuff, it's not just going to the field and just do busting out a painting. You know, it's like I, I put in a lot of effort before, like studying the players and their body language and their movement and how they wear their uniform and everything. Like I have some drawings, like at some point I I want to take this art and I want to have a gallery of like prep work of, cause I, I have things where I study pictures enough where you could do, you could make an animation of their pitch. You know, I draw every second of their pitch, you know, of their follow through and everything. So when I'm at the game, when they're pitching, I don't have to think about it. I can just see it and, and draw it. You know, I don't have to worry about it. I already studied them. Um, so it, it becomes a little bit of a magic magic trick when somebody behind me is watching me do this and they just see it just happen, right? It's like these ball players that get out there and they hit a home run, but they spend all this time batting practice and doing all this stuff and all year long and working out. It's muscle memory at the end of the day. Is it a similar thing to when you're drawing G.I. Joe that you kind of have maybe looked at the figure, turned it around in your head, had yeah. uh, committed I, it to I'd memory say, and like, I can put that aside now and I can just reproduce what's in my mind on the paper. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of, when you, when you, when you put up like the image of the, the baseball stuff of a whole, you know, a whole season of like, you know, a few hundred pieces that I did. And then you go to the GI Joe one where it's, you know, I have a whole, you know, yeah, I do a, a few hundred GI Joe drawings you know, then all the sketches that are people are asking me to do and stuff. I just had recently like this one guy, I won't name him, but he was, he was uh, in a private message. Like, I really like your work. He goes, but, and I want to commission you, but I got burned the last two commissions that I had done. So he's like, I'm just kind of like, I don't know if I want to have you do a commission because I just, I'm like, I, just so you know, like, I'm going to go all out tell me who your favorite figures are a vehicle or whatever and you're gonna get something cool I mean, he's like and then a few days later i posted something else and he just said all right i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do it and then so i did it i haven't posted that one yet but he wanted uh snake eyes and scarlet and then i i so i've been kind of having like this weird little story going on with snake eyes and scarlet even in my sketches and they've been sneaking into this Cobra layer too. And so it was just this progression of that. And so he got one little, because to me, these little things are six by eights. And, you know, I'm doing paint, they're painted, they're painted pieces. And I'm not charging that much for them. You know, they should be like five, $600 paintings, you know, but I'm not charging that much, <laughs> but it's fun to do them. So I'm like, well, I don't care. It's like, you're going to get something cool out of this and also for me it's just like it just keeps me doing it right if you really like me doing gi joe and stuff you know support support the stuff that i'm doing and i'll keep doing it um i i keep thinking like at the end of doing a series like this like i'm done i'm not going to do it anymore then a few months will go by and i'll be like i miss these guys <laughs> i want to i want to kind of sketch I don't know what it would be like. I constantly think like, well, what would it be like working with Larry on the comic? You know, would it be a good thing? Would it be a bad thing? I, you know, again, it's like the reason 
I kind of, I made it awkward just because of what was going on in my head and I couldn't spit out like what I wanted to say because I didn't know what I wanted to say. And, and, you know, he was very nice and it's, you know, like Ron Rudat, like I've talked to him, but again, I pulled back from him too. It's just, I, I just want to keep this stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of almost probably protecting myself of like, I don't want a bad experience to happen with GI Joe. Cause I don't want to have like this taint on, on what, you know, of my love for it, you know? Even as I was asking you that question earlier about working perhaps for Hazra or Skybound, part of my brain was saying, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, but you, the thing that you're getting is instantaneous um, work, right? Where if I do work for GI Joe or if I work on Hasbro or Skybound, you won't see any of my work because now it will be within the corporate system of you. It's got to wait for t- three months before it comes out, you know? And I can't talk about the thing that I'm working on where this is just like, blah, here you go. <laughs> this is, this is all my love in your face. Now back to GI Joe. And speaking so. of people being able to buy your stuff, send you money, the you you did have your your 2024 prints for the GI Joes. I think that is now. Yeah, it's closed. done. It's I only done. I only I only I, I make a very small because again when I did that Hector Garrido after Garrido project everybody was asking me, Oh, I want to buy that original artwork. I want to buy that original artwork. And then I said, well, this is a painting and this is how much it is. And they're like, Oh, I can't, I can't buy that. (laughs) So then I was like, well, what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, I could make like a little short print run of this stuff. I'm not mass, you know, I'm not going to keep it in print. It's just going to be this little special little thing and it'll come and go. And if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. So that's kind of how I've, done all this it's just like you know i'm studying this stuff i'm paying for all this paint and paper and whatnot and the time that it takes me to do it so it's just i don't know it's it's just it's fun to be able to and then for the most part how i'm selling them is i i don't word it like this i probably should but it's like if you buy a sketch you get the print pack you know you get the prints for free you know it's like i'm not necessarily selling like prints of this stuff it's like it's just you got to buy the original sketch or something and then you'll get the prints or else you can just look at it online, you know, or if you're a real big fan of mine, you can print it out and hang it all over your wall, you know? <laughs> so, but you have to be a, you have to be a real big fan of mine if you're going to print it out and make a t-shirt, you know, I'm a particular kind of fan. I'm going to, I'm going to save all these JPEGs and just crop them down <laughs> to your hand yeah. holding the yeah. brush. No, exactly. That's, that's what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting. And I know now you, I'm going to get, get people being funny, like sending me paintings or T-shirts of my hand holding the brush. So, Will you be at any uh, conventions uh, in 2024? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I want to go to the Joe. There's a Joe show in Texas. The and- DFW, Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Uh, which is in June. Yeah, but I don't know if I can. I I want to do that. If I'm going to do a Joe show, that would be the show. And I know like that's like I I think it's at the same time as Joe Fest. It is. Which yeah, which is kind of hard hard to do cuz it's like, man, I want to do that show too, but a good friend of mine, he's he's been telling me because he lives in Shreveport, Louisiana, and so that's pretty close a uh, couple hour drive from Dallas. And he, he was like, no, you got to come to this Dallas show. It's really, it's, it's, it's growing. And it's, 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 uh, I think it, it like Ron is going to be there. Larry's going to be there. Kirk is going to be there. I think every, almost like a lot of, a lot of Joe people are going to be there. So it should be a big uptick this year. Um, if you go, you'll miss us. Oh no, you're going to Joe Fest. We're going to be at the other show. And yeah, and well, we, why did they we... do that? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we recognize that the scheduling is a, a real uh, a tough one for lots of people who yeah. would love to do both shows. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I am out of questions. 
Wow. Yeah. Thinking of the listeners, they're going to be thinking about, uh, they might be discovering your work for the first time mm-hmm. or, or just being uh, pumped up by, by seeing some of that gorgeous art and thinking about buying buying something. So I guess for that audience, you know, they can see it online, uh, for, yeah. on your on your various social medias. They can throw some money away or for, for a, an expensive commission to do something that is just for them yeah. or expensive, but good value, let's say. Um, <laughs> and well, all, it's not too um, expensive, but it can get. No, no, no. It it's all relative, depending on how big things get. But yeah, yeah if you want six it, by yeah. four, yeah, yeah, six <laughs> by eight, six by eight is pretty good, you know. And again, it's like those, feet. Most, some of those ones that you sent. Yeah, the six foot by four feet. Yeah, that's going to be expensive. If you have Facebook money, yeah, exactly. Commission, <laughs> commission, Kickley for a Come door, right my way. a door sized <laughs> oil double painting. door. Yeah. And and otherwise, I guess it's it's the that we're going to cross our cross our fingers and hope that inspiration and um, the the urge to draw uh, GI Joe kicks in before too very long, and uh, and you start thinking about the uh, the next set and I guess moving on probably to the to the next year wave of characters to to explore. Yeah, 1987 is a good year. You know, I was kind of dipping into it with this last series, right? I was showing some of the movie stuff and because it, it, again, it was, it was too hard to be like, ah, oh, 1987 is really a good, a good year. And it has the, uh, the defiant, you know, my closing idea, I'm going to, I'm going to try and combine two of your worlds, <laughs> go to some GI Joe conventions mm-hmm. and paint the crowds and the dealers there. Yeah. I thought about that. Like it's a sporting event. It's like, yeah, I oh, here's it, here's you know? a Hasbro designer with a, oh, there's Sergeant Slaughter with a big autograph line and some yeah. long boxes of comics for the person behind him. Yeah, I've, you know, I thought about it because again, it's like, yeah, well, well, you see the toys and it's like, oh, that's a cool toy. I wouldn't normally buy that, but I'd like to paint it. But then I'd be sitting in front of somebody's booth doing a painting and everyone would stop and, and it'd be a big, huge, like, uh, uh, log jam in the aisle and the the people the booth that's getting painted would love it but the other booths that are <laughs> being clogged up would hate me so i don't know if i'd be willing to do it but i've thought about it you know i've not been offered that yet i don't you know again i've gone to a few shows like um pheasants forever they had me at a show and i was doing that there because they had like um uh, taxidermy birds and animals and stuff. And I was like, Oh, I want to paint that <laughs> I'd set up and I'd start painting it. And, and that's what would happen is everything would get log jammed. So yeah, my website is the easiest way. If you want to buy the current book, uh, Tiempo Sonales that I'm working on. And at some point, like I'll probably recollect Musne into a hard or like a soft cover collection. So it's not for, for books. And I'll probably also collect Purdy in the books i just got somebody who emailed me yesterday it was out of the blue and she was like hey are you gonna do more purdy i just read volume one and two and she goes i want to know what happens i'm like i want to know what happens too like i designed that as like a six i think it's going to be it'll be six books so there's four more books to to tell the the complete story and it's like yeah i just set the first two books are kind of the setup of the story. So it's kind of, I really want to get to my point, you know? I'm going to vote for you to uh, reprint Purdy 1 and 2, because while you were talking after I had you pitch your own book and I told people that they Uh could go to the comic book store and get it because it's published by Image, I checked (laughs) Diamond. I checked Diamond and it's out of stock. I don't know if that means Diamond moved all of its copies to Simon & Schuster. Yeah. Yeah, it's out of print, I, I believe. Yeah. So everyone, just go to Kickley's website and yeah. throw some money at Kickley and send yeah. a message saying you're interested in one of these past books coming back into print. And and uh, uh, Mark's Mark, what you ordered the pack of prints and an original painting? Yeah, you should have it. I shipped it to your store. So. Uh yes. Yeah, so uh. But so like it's... this, these are these are like stuff I wore this is like 600 some page books like I filled them up with during the pandemic while I was sitting I had to go downstairs and watch my kids to make sure they were doing the homework from school you know because they were on the computers and my kids were lying to us saying 
oh no, we did we did everything. And then two weeks would go by and the teachers were like, they're not sending in any of their homework. And we're like, what? <laughs> they're saying they're doing it. So I had to be down there watching them. So I, I got some of these books that I'd bring to Paris and fill up. I, I went downstairs and I just started drawing. I'm like, I'm just going to fill these things up and learn. Like I finish my Jedi training in a sense of what I started in Paris, but then I kind of stopped because I was doing comics and I'm like, no, I'm going to finish my, my, uh, my studying here. And my kids were watching me do this because normally they would run upstairs and go, Oh, what'd you work on today? And I'd show them and they're like, wow, that's really cool. And it's finished stuff. Right. So I was working down there and they're like, this is how you do this. Like, this is how you go about drawing. You know, they would see, like, all the preparation stuff that I'd do. You know, not just the finished piece. They would see me working on it. And so my daughter started drawing like this, too, in her in her sketchbooks and my son as well. And they, I, I think it's, like, I really clicked in my head of, like, oh, no, they're seeing the magic show, right? They're seeing, oh, Dad did this today. Dad did this. Dad did, did this but they didn't see like what I actually, how I got there, the stages of that. But it's like, I've got books full of ideas, you know, I've got any kind of genre that I want to do. It's just, it's now at the certain point of like, I want to get one going self-published and that's why I chose Tiempo Sonales. And once I get that going, then I'll come and start doing the other things. So it becomes easier. You know, I don't want to launch with five books and then never finish any of them. So that was kind of the frustrating part with, um, with doing, you know, at least with Musne, Musne was, was like a four issue, you know, four issue thing. And it was like, okay, it's done. I want to continue it, but this is at least kind of, you get a story arc and Purdy, you get a story arc, but it's ended at, a point where it's like, okay, I like this, but not, I want, I want more of this, you know? So it, it's not to say Purdy too, by the time you get done reading, it's like, ah, what, what's going to go on next? You just want to know more of it. My wife told me, she goes, I just watch Purdy doing anything, you know? <laughs> She's like, I don't care. She's like, it's just fun, fun watching this character go. And yeah. Cause it's kind of a humor. You like the, the thing is, is I did a Western, but it's, it's funny, you know, <laughs> sorry. Should the interview be over? By- <laughs> <laughs> like uh, well, Mark, and then, Mark's, you know, when I was 12, it's, uh, it's right? like 2 AM where Mark I is. Know, so I know. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> See the lights went out. Mark's Mark's the lights been out for a while. I'm Mark. Mark. <laughs> it's like yeah oh the sun's yeah. going this oh yeah. no yeah that was great quickly it's was, it was great hanging out um getting the um not you know not just to talk about gi joe but uh to understand you know where it's all come from so um thank you so much for for taking the time and just being so generous with your your time and, and talking to us and i'm, I'm sure people w- will be very interested to, to hear your story and, and you know yeah. how you've well, got hopefully, to, to where you... hopefully there'll be uh other announcements regarding gi joe if your wishes come true you know yeah <laughs> if you want me to work on other stuff hopefully my tempered we'll wishes <laughs> yeah. yeah more joe but keep it keep enjoying it <laughs> yeah, yeah. right kind of magical joe uh all right so we uh we have told people about your website and um uh, people can find you on instagram and uh mark shall we wrap up. yeah where can people find you tim when uh you're not talking to me and special guests video essays on tv and film uh at uh my youtube page at atomic abe my brick and mortar comic book shop in somerville massachusetts is hub comics and we just announced three events for april and i write about gi joe at my blog a real american book.com and if you are new to Talking Joe, you can find us at talkingjoe.co.uk. That has links to all of the places that we can be found. Uh, and with all of that said and done, we'll wrap up by reminding people, Tim, that... Nobody beats Talking Joe and 
International Podcast. Meow. Laters. Yeah, he wants dinner. Yeah.